Hello YouTube. So, um, I want to examine some of Quine's uh, objections to modal logic now. Um, I just want to say before I start that this video isn't all that important. You can skip it if you want. Um, it's, it's really more of uh, historical interest and if you approach it as anything more than that you might feel by the end that you've just wasted your time. Um, but uh, I wanted to, to just have a look at this anyway. So um, Quine famously said that modal logic was conceived in sin. What was this sin? It concerns the use and mention distinction. Now this is a very important distinction uh, which anybody who has even the slightest interest in modern philosophy should be aware of. Um, so uh, you might be, you might already know about this but I just wanted to cover it again just to, to make sure. Um, so consider these two sentences. Frank Zappa was a musician and Frank Zappa contains two words. Now in both of these sentences we have the name Frank Zappa but it's functioning in very different ways in each sentence. Now in, in the first sentence uh, we say that his name is being used and in the second it is being mentioned. So what's going on here? Well, the point is that whenever we refer to some object or property or whatever, we have to name it. Now, it's, it's pretty simple in the case of sentence one. What's going on in one is we are referring to Frank Zappa. And in order to do that, we're just using the words Frank Zappa. In the case of sentence two, we're not referring to Frank Zappa himself. We're referring to his name. Um, and there are actually many ways of referring to Frank Zappa's name uh, that perhaps would make the distinction here clearer. Um, so one way of referring to it might be the name printed at the top of the front cover of Hot Rats. I mean, pretty clearly there, we are not referring to the person Frank Zappa. We're referring to Frank Zappa's name. Um, so we would, we would say the name printed at the top of the front cover of Hot Rats contains two words. Uh, the problem with doing it this way is that it's just really inconvenient. Um, if you simply take the name that you want to denote and then enclose it in quotation marks, well, that's much quicker and it provides a very easy universal rule. And that method is uh, called quotation. Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't have to be a person's name. It can be uh, the name of anything or just sort of words in general. Um, so... Um, Let's just make sure you know exactly what's going on here. Um, if you take the statement, Frank Zappa contains two words, well, this statement is false because Frank Zappa was a, uh, a human, not the kind of thing that can contain words. Or you could take number six, Frank Zappa was a musician. This is false because Frank Zappa, enclosed in quotation marks, that refers to a person's name. A person's name isn't a musician, it's just a linguistic object. Okay, so you can see how, how that works. Uh, it's worth pointing out that um, you might want to refer to the object that refers to Frank Zappa's name. So consider uh, this, Frank Zappa contains one pair of quotation marks. We have two pairs of quotation marks um, here. And so we're not referring to Frank Zappa's name. We're referring to the thing that refers to Frank Zappa's name. OK, and you can extend those indefinitely. Although I imagine it would get pretty complicated after after a little while. Um, so that's the sort of use and, and mention distinction. Uh, the problem with these sentences here is that in number five, we are uh, using Frank Zappa's name when we really should be mentioning it because we want to talk about his name, not the man. And in number six, we are mentioning Frank Zappa's name when we should be using it because we want to talk about the man and not the name. Okay, so uh, it's also worth pointing out that use and mention can occur in the same sentence. So consider these two sentences. The first name in each is being mentioned and the second is being used. Um, I'm sure you've got the idea of this distinction. Uh, look it up online if you're still not sure or wherever. Just remember that in this case we have uh, mention and in this case we have use. Uh, this refers to the man Frank Zappa. Uh, 
this refers to his name. This refers to Frank Zappa's name. This refers to the thing that refers to Frank Zappa's name. Um, so you can't distinguish use and mention uh, just by looking at quotation marks because quotation, you can have quotation marks in both use and mention. So uh, just bear that in mind. You have to pay attention to the context too. But it's usually pretty obvious. Um, but you do have to bear that distinction in mind otherwise you'll end up making some pretty absurd statements like these two up here. Okay, now we need to consider another important distinction. In logic there is the distinction between the object language and the meta language. Now essentially the object language is the language being studied and the meta language is the language we use to talk about the object language. So um, let's say we're using standard propositional logic. Uh, a propositional logic uses a language that consists of uh, propositional variables and connectives and so on and um, sort of rules for stringing them together so you can have formulas like this this is what you you have in the language of propositional logic uh, if p then p not p and not p now that would be an example of the object language those are formulas of the object language um, now consider these statements if p then p contains one connective, p then p is logical truth, and so on. Well, in this case, what we are doing is we are talking about the this language. We're talking about the formulas of the object language. So this is the meta language. So in propositional logic, the object language is uh, something that consists of connectives and then propositional variables. And as you can see, I mean, it's not it's not any real language. Whereas in this case down here, this meta language is just plain old English. Uh, so we have the object language there and the meta language talking about it. Um, okay, so I'm sure you've got these distinctions, um, but what do they have to do with Quine's objections? We saw in the last video how uh, Lewis's motivation for developing modal logic was based on his dissatisfaction with the material conditional. Um, the material conditional, as we saw, uh, seems to uh, force you to accept uh, rather counterintuitive arguments. And the two that bothered Lewis were, were these two. Um, and um, so taking this case, for example, well, we can say Frank Zappa was a musician, that's P, and from this we know that if the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician. If P, then if Q, then P. Um, now, the problem with this sort of thing is, is that it doesn't really seem to capture how implication actually works. Um, and uh, what Lewis did, Lewis developed the strict conditional, defined necessarily if P, then Q, uh, in order to provide a connective that would more adequately describe uh, implication. Um, and of course in, in the case of the strict conditional we can only say that P implies Q when it's necessarily the case that uh, P implies Q. And Lewis thought that that more adequately captured uh, how actual implication works. So Quine's objection revolves around the conditional. Um, I want you to consider these two statements. If the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician. The moon is made of cheese implies Frank Zappa was a musician. Now, um, grammatically speaking, these seem perfectly fine. And, uh, I mean, indeed, I don't think anybody would object to these. But now consider this sentence. If the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician. This sentence is ungrammatical. It's important to note the quotation marks. Recall how quotation works. Uh, in this case, when we have Frank Zappa was a musician here, in this case, we're not using the sentence Frank Zappa was a musician, we're naming it. So this part here, this Frank Zappa was a musician enclosed in quotation marks, this is a name, as is uh, this part here, the moon is made of cheese. So um, we have these two bits are names. And in this case, the conditional is completely inappropriate. Because 
of these quotation marks. What we have is somewhat akin to saying, if Frank Zappa, then Bob Dylan, because these two bits are just names. And of course, that's meaningless. Uh, the point is that the conditional is a connective of the object language, which joins different statements together. And you have to you have to use those statements, not mention them. It doesn't join names together, it joins statements together. Use, not mention. Now consider, the moon is made of cheese implies Frank Zappa was a musician. Well, according to Quine, this is also ungrammatical. Why? Well, implication is a concept of the meta-language. So uh, consider, consider truth. Let's take these two statements. Now, the, the second statement here, 3a, is clearly ungrammatical, since truth is something that applies to names of statements. Um, if you want to say that a statement is true or false, then you have to refer to that statement. So you have to mention it, not use it. And the idea is that implication, uh, as a concept of the, the meta-language, um, also requires you to mention, not use, the names of statements. If you want to say that uh, some statement implies some other statement, then it requires that you name those statements. So, um, in other words, to give some concrete examples, if P then Q, this is totally legitimate. Um, that's just, you know, within the object language, if P then Q, a conditional. But we shouldn't say P implies Q. We, we should not say that. We should instead say, P, enclosed in quotation marks, implies Q, enclosed in quotation marks. We should mention our uh, the, the P and Q rather than use them. Um, so basically, there is the conditional. The conditional is an object language connective used in formal logic, um, which you use to join statements to other statements. Um, and then you have implication. Implication is a metalinguistic concept and uh, it describes the consequence relation. Um, so uh, it's sort of analogous to truth in, in that you, you have to, it's metalinguistic and that you mention statements rather than use them. Um, so I mean, just, just think about it. The object language has all the connectives and, and variables and so on, whereas the meta language deals with stuff like truth and consequence and implication and all that. Um, so, I mean, that's, a, I think, a perfectly reasonable distinction. Um, now, according to Quine, Lewis's sin was to confuse these two concepts. Um, what was that confusion? Well, the problem is that necessarily, if P then Q, according to Quine, doesn't actually describe implication. And it can't, in principle, describe implication because necessarily if P then Q is just a formula of the object language, while implication is a concept within the meta language. All Lewis has done, according to Quine, is define a new connective. That's all, that's all he's got, is a new connective in the object language. So basically, Quine's point is that just because we accept the material conditional, uh, it doesn't follow that we we have to accept material implication. So we can accept these formulas here, if P, then if Q, then P, and so on. doesn't mean we have to accept material implication. There's a difference between the material conditional and material implication. If we say, if P, then Q, that's different from saying P implies Q. Um, so if we know that Frank Zappa was a musician, then we can assert, if the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician, if P then Q. But we can reject, the moon is made of cheese implies Frank Zappa was a musician. So, knowing that Frank Zappa was a musician, and knowing if P then, if Q then P, we can assert the conditional, but reject the implication, because the conditional and the implication are two different things. I hope you see how that works. And what Quine, and Quine's point is that Lewis confused this. All Lewis has actually done is just create a new connective within the object language. He hasn't actually even he hasn't talked about implication. He hasn't touched on implication. He's just 
defined a new way of doing the conditional. Um, so I, I hope you see that. I know that that's perhaps quite subtle, um, and um, I'm not I'm not sure if I've explained it in perhaps the easiest way, but I hope you see how that works. Uh, now, I mean this this objection as an objection to modal logic in general is fairly easily met. I think. Um, even Quine himself would have accepted that people might have other reasons for exploring modal logic. I mean, these days, the vast majority of people working in modal logic aren't particularly concerned about whether they could use the notion of necessity to solve the paradoxes of material implication. Um, so uh, you're probably thinking that if this is the calibre of critique that Quine can offer, then uh, modal logicians have um, nothing to fear. Um, well, we'll see in the next video that his other criticisms are rather more substantial, uh, but I think this is enough for today. And as I said at the beginning, this is really just a historical point. Quine, when he said that modal logic was conceived in sin, he really was just talking about the conception of modal logic, the first uh, formulation of it and the first reasons for developing it. Um, he had other criticisms which were... Uh, far sort of deeper and attacked the whole enterprise. But we'll encounter them in later videos. Um, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.